Welcome to Swan Dive's first bonus episode by the Savage Godlings. Today, I am going to be joined by Christopher Taylor and Grant Howitt, the authors of both Spire and Heart, the games upon which this program is based. We'll also be discussing the tabletop role-playing game community at large, design, and their past together as designers. I hope you'll forgive any awkwardness in this particular episode's recording, as my particular vocal track was lost, and I had to redub myself back in. So, uh, forgiveness goes a long way. If you've just joined us, I hope that you can take the time to go back in the archive and join us on the adventure that is Swan Dive, our cell's attempt to free the drow from Elfir supremacy. Enjoy. I'm deep fried a ghost! Hello, I'm Grant Howitt and I write role playing games. And I'm joined by Christopher Edward Taylor, who also writes role playing games, and sometimes we write the same role playing game. I'm I'm the Chris one. <laughs> yeah, I'm the Grant one. I've said that. Thank you so much for coming on, guys. I really can't thank you enough. So to start off, could you guys just kinda of give me a rundown of kind of your background in role playing games? Chris, how do you get hooked on the demon teat? Uh, <laughs> so I, I mean I started playing games real early. My mother was very insistent that I do something with my life. And apparently <laughs> playing games was that thing. Um, <laughs> Fool! <laughs> I know, right? Regrets it now. Yeah. Um, you could have been an accountant. I could have made something of myself. Mm. Um, but as far as actual games design, I mean, honestly, it was to stave off madness. Mm. Uh, it's how I started doing it. Because um, I was living on my own in wanted to talk to Grant more, so we just started making a game. Oh, we, we did Zombie back in the day. Yeah, we did Zombie. We um, did a, we did a live a, action game at uni. Yeah, like a large scale horror LARP with Nerf guns. Like intentionally broken and shitty Nerf guns. It, see, it, like, it seemed really incredible, and like, I think there's a lot of divergent evolution in that we hadn't heard of Humans vs. Zombies, and we sort of started coming up with stuff. Divergent? Convergent. Parallel, that's the word. Um, but like... So in, in Humans vs. Zombies, from what I can tell, it's like a full week, and you can do things like throw your socks at zombies to kill them, and like there's, and there's certain safe zones and stuff. And we trapped teams of six in a converted sports hall, and they had about a seven-minute lifespan. It was, it was very much like, uh, like ten hours of build-up for a seven-minute mm. run. And it worked, weirdly. It, yeah, because it it, like, the entire place was dark, and all the torches worked maybe 20% of the time. We got the worst batteries we could. Yeah, and people were genuinely terrified for the entire mm. time. And any time they weren't on a run, they were being zombies. So they were, mm. it was building them up and seeing how the players were scared during mm. this kind of amped it. Oh, we scaled it up. We managed to run at a, uh, an abandoned shopping mall in Reading. Uh, which was so cool, and we we did a we did a similar game for the release of Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Yeah, thanks we to 20th did. Century Fox, you idiots. Oh, uh, zomb- uh, no headshots for for health and safety, which is very boring. Um, but uh, uh, it, was, it, it was like you, you, you at best you stun a zombie, and if you shoot a zombie when it's down, it's dead until you leave the area, at which point it just gets back up and wanders around. So it's so it's possible to pacify an area and kind of hold out. But it costs a lot of ammo, uh, and as far as players go, it was like it was like you got you got three hits, and then and then you went down or two hits or what have you, um, and it was a game solely focused around dying excitingly. Like the point was the point was not to win. We said the point was to win. We gave you mechanics to win, and it was exciting to win. But it was much more exciting to die messy. Yeah, like you'd have people holding corridors and letting the rest of their team get out because they've got yeah, one yeah. hit left and it, they can save for the rest of their team so they go down in the blaze of glory. You did you did sort of get arguments over who would get to go down in the blaze of glory. Which is, <laughs> which is the best kind of argument to have in a game. Yeah. Like, no, today I want to be the martyr. <laughs> so I'm sensing a theme here. Yes, yes, we have been broadly obsessed with death for our careers. <laughs> and, and indeed, private lives, to be honest with you. Yeah. It was like it was like I I I played a few times. Chris, you had a couple of runs, didn't you? Yep. Yeah. And at no point was I pretending to be scared. No, no, it was it was genuine like adrenaline fueled terror. Like you know, it's all fake, but there's this there's this like, because zombies like, zombie makeup consists of blood, 
over the face. And that's a fresh zombie right there. Like It's very hard to make any other supernatural creature look right, but zombies you can get basically free. And so you, you like we used to make up um, vats of fake blood out of, what was it, syrup? Treacle? Yes, Food yes, colouring um, and, and, and hot water. Yeah. And it, you get yeah. this, like... You oh, get it's delicious. Thick, oh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, it's um, hugely sticky. But it's smear bright it over your red. Mm. Um, and it, it stays roughly where it's put. Mm. So when, when you're like, even it's all quiet, and you open a door and you shine a light into a room, and you can just see, like, in, in one of the rooms, it's like a basketball court area. And you can see maybe 50 people in there <laughs> just, just done up as zombies. <laughs> just Just hovering in the dark. You like, don't need to pretend. Oh, oh shit! Yeah, yeah, it is. It is genuinely scary, and like, it doesn't matter that that you know the name, the actual names of every single person in that hall. Yeah, they're a zombie at that point, and you just run. I think that like what one thing which we were really keen on doing was like cutting almost all the rules out of the games. I think we had no calls eventually, which is there was only for safety calls. Um, yeah. Um, which was stop the game rather than man down, which is commonly used in LARP. It just seems like a really stupid thing to, to have in a game. Because that's the sort of thing you definitely yell in as part of an exciting scene. Anyway. Yeah. And that was like, and that was like where I think like it informs our game design like later on. We keep trying to pair back. So, so like, so the rules are, the rules are there supporting it like a structure, but everything else is, is, is sitting on top and it allows you to interact with it. You, you're looking for kind of a, not quite seamless, but you want the rules to, you want the rules to support play. And with, with Zombie, we had no calls, we had no player names, we had really easy to remember character classes, even if there were character classes. There was one flavor of damage, Zo- like melee weapon damage, mainly focused around how hard you shouted when you swung the sledgehammer or what have you. Uh, it was all about how much you put in, and it was it was all, um, yeah, it was it was silly fuck about make pretend, and because of that, you were able to just enter it, which was really exciting. And you'd never you'd never have that moment where somebody went, no, I hit you, no, that's not how the rules work. It would never break for the entire run. I will say there was this one brilliant time where um, Ruth, a friend of mine, uh, someone got really freaked out and hit her hard in the crotch with an axe when she was a zombie, and she sort of just. <laughs> So sort of stepped forward and took it off him. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> but aside from that, we're fine. <laughs> so, was this the first time you guys got together to work in university? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it is. Yeah, we were. We basically played in like five role playing games a week together. Chris was my first DM. He's my, yeah. but, well, okay, no, sorry. My first DM was this absolute sack of dicks called James Moran, um, and that and that isn't yeah, that isn't really, that isn't uh, slander. Like I think it's something which he set out to be. Oh, he'd be proud. Oh yeah, yeah he, he was a top draw shit heel. Like and like and like interesting guy. Don't get me wrong. I just wouldn't trust him with a fiver. Chris was my first. I'm going to say like the first GM who I managed to learn anything from. <laughs> <laughs> And you, uh, you put, you you showed me my first, you gave me my first taste of D and D. Yep. I remember I turned up with a model because I thought you needed a model to play. I, I, p- I painted a little wood elf archer. I was like, here, here we are. I bought, I bought my wood elf to play. And Chris was like, shut up, you're a cleric. <laughs> a dwarven cleric, no. <laughs> you're a dwarven cleric. Shut up and get in there. It's a minotaur. Hit it. What else is a minotaur for? <laughs> so, what what edition of D and D was this? Oh, it was three point five. Yeah, this will be back in two thousand and five, I think. Oh, mate, I, years. What even are yes. they? Yeah. Um, so we met at university, and um, Chris and I, I think we pretty much decided to be best friends about four months in. It was a cordial agreement. Yeah, and that's never that's never really faded. No. Which is strange. You think that? I mean, I, I think we've we've had bits where we didn't talk to each other for a couple of months just because we lived in different parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, but we've generally, yeah, we've spoken to each other. I think broadly once every, at least once every three months, and now four times a day, <laughs> for several hours because we're doing work. Yeah, in quotation marks. Yeah, yeah, mainly just you playing Battlefield. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so beyond zombie was Unbound your first collaboration together? That's the first thing we published, I think, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, we just about worked out how to break even on zombie. Um, when unfortunately, well, we lost access to the mall that we were running it in, and the university that we were running it in, and realised that it was going to be quite hard to hire somewhere in London 
um, and not yeah. charge not charge people 150 quid a ticket. So we just sort of just, got, just sort of folded it quietly. The website's still there. It's quite sad, really. The last post from 2012. So, some lovely pictures of the event. Yeah. Yes. And I don't exactly know if picking it up, you know, this day and age is going to sell hugely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, lots, lots of abandoned buildings. We So Unbound was the first thing which we published, and that was when Chris was saying that he was going slightly mad. Uh, I was going... I was. I, you know what I'm going to say? I was more mad when I was you, in New York. You were power mad at the time. I, yeah. was, I was like four barrels full calibre mad. I really didn't like New York, and I was unwell in the head. And Chris um, was dealing with... I think it was year two of living with your folks. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, maybe like, yeah, yeah. You, you were halfway through year two, and so we were both starting to sort of come unhinged, and we'd spend a lot of time playing video games with each other. Uh, we started streaming a little bit, we did, like, we played Resident Evil Resident Evil 6 together yep. online. Yeah, we did. The, the first five episodes of which are available, which had the, um, like, uh, Chris's audio was recorded by me just leaving, me playing my speakers into my mic. That's that's right. how effective it was. And, like, and it was, I was in a large room a large oh, it was so professional. furnitureless room. Oh yeah, real swish. Um, but then we decided that rather than try and do something which required like professionalism in the moment, we could instead write a role playing game. And so we did Unbound. Awesome. Yeah, uh, a fairly successful Kickstarter. Um, so Grant, up until that point, you had still had some success with uh, Goblin Quest. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I'd done Goblin Quest, which is uh, it's a game called Wushu by Dan Bain. I don't know whether you know about it. That was the first game which I ever ran for Chris, and I'm going to say roughly half of my games are just overcomplicated wushu, and Goblin Quest, yeah, Goblin Quest is just overcomplicated wushu, but it's got a like a rule book attached to it and stuff, and drawings of goblins. Um, but yeah, I owe I owe Dan Bain a lot of royalties. If like if he, if he finds out and comes knocking, I am fucked. <laughs> but we've done, we've done, we, we've done. We, uh, so we've done Goblin Quest, um, and so like um, uh, my partner Mary, who's the other, who's the third part of um, Rowan Rick and Deckard, uh, our, our our business now. Uh, they'd help me publish that. Uh, but uh, Chris, yeah, how how did we start writing on Bound? Do you remember? Because I think it started out as kind of a D and D clone, didn't it? Yeah, it started out as a fantasy heartbreaker. It was like, uh, well, D- we want, yeah, we want to play a fantasy game. We don't particularly enjoy the fancy games going, so let's see what we can do. Um, and we were looking at the sort of the more tactical end of combat, which is where mm-hmm. the Unbound combat system came from. But it very quickly dawned on us that you could actually do anything in this system as long as it was mm-hmm. pulp, as long as it was firing two guns whilst jumping sideways, mm-hmm. so you, swinging over gaps, as long as it was big and mm-hmm. exciting, you could do it, it in this system. It made sense. Yeah. yeah, you couldn't do invest, you know, slow investigation. No, but you could throw yourself down a mountainside and live to tell the tale, and that that was great. And we built in the 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 kind of the best session zero that we've ever done into the system. Uh, session zero was unbound as majestic. It's astonishing. It's great fun. Um, yeah, where you you build the world and you work out absolutely every thing you're going to need for the game. Yeah, going back and reading Unbound, I found that it seems to have a lot of really like sensibilities and styles that are very popular these days, and more you know narrative heavy. You're um, belonging outside belonging and what have you? Exactly, exactly. Sort of your yeah. anti-canon stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like in the playtest, we had what we had. We played Wizards on a school trip. That was fun. Yeah. Um, we played. Well, I, I, so of... it was a school trip which was designed to kill us for insurance purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we did a sort of nature spirits embodied as armor people. One game where they all played whales. That was one of the playtesters. Yes, there was. Yeah, there was a game just just of whales. It's 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 very flexible, and I think like it it tend it tends towards sci fantasy. Yeah. Uh, just just because of the touchstone list that we drew up at the start. So there's there's a, there's a list of words you pick from, and you all sort of pitch them as a group, and then build a setting out of it. And you always end up with, oh, what what if a wizard went to space? Uh, that's that's broadly the game. <clears throat> yeah, and but the big it's... problem with it is that it's it requires a lot of brain cycles to run. That's a lot of processing power on the players because they've got to think of everything, mm. and so they're like, responsible for it. You know, well, well, like with a the the real challenge that I found with it uh, was like when we got to Kickstarter, I was trying to sell the damn thing because like especially in terms like. You can't really sell rules to anyone except um, game designers. It's like 
like you have to sell the concept of a good session or some nice drawings or imagine imagine the fun times you'll have in this game and that's and, that, and that's what you sell on Kickstarter and the majority of people who buy games aren't game designers and the challenge with Unbound is like well what kind of stories can you tell oh anything buy it and you, and you completely lose it and like GURPS never had to go through Kickstarter and that's the thing like like Fate managed like GURPS um has got its niche which is which is kind of it's the role playing equivalent of like a train simulator I understand that. <laughs> um, and Fate has this, has I think it's, it's quite close to um, to Unbound in a lot of ways. And it's quite pulpy, and you've you, you got these like over top characters, and the, 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 their shared their shared history together, and about how they how they tackle the world, and what sort of problems there are, and everything's woven into the characters. Um, and I think with Unbound, we hadn't quite worked out what our pitch was, what 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 it does separately from other generic games, what it does separately from other games, and it does pulp. It does this weird mix of combat which is both cinematic and tactical and that and that i've not seen anything which really did that like feng shui came close but it's like it's so easy to get to get bogged down into oh, what, what am i doing on this second how what, what sort of range has my gun got and it's so easy to uh like what you what you abstract is important which is why we were playing a lot of secret world oh like the mmo yeah, yeah. the unbound the unbound um combat system is basically secret world with the with serial numbers filed off <laughs> you don't want to say no to players. You want to give them the capacity and the freedom to, like, to, 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 as Chris was saying, like, jump, jump out of a window and land on something and slide around. But you want to give them the freedom to say that, but not have them completely, like, completely unmoored from any sort of reality. Uh, and like, uh, like certain groundings in terms of like, so like we've made sure that the like, that the areas, like the 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 fight zone, is broken up into areas and connections, and and like the moves have very have certain keywords which power off each other. So there is a level of positioning which is um which is useful, but it's uh yeah I think I think we managed we managed to strike a chord where you can you can say what you want, but also mechanically there's there's some challenge there which is fun. Awesome, and and I've heard you guys talk a little bit. I think on the Discord and sort of you know those general areas that you talked about, maybe getting unpublic or unbound back out there, uh, maybe a republishing or something like that. No, we want yes. to we want to yeah. get unbound back out there because at the moment it's it's only available as PDF, mm. um, and we'd like to get it back out there as as a as a physical book. Mm. Not sure when. No, because um, at the moment we're still wrangling with the US Postal Service with Hart. Yeah. So we we'd, we'd like to get everything lined up before we before we like definitely um, launch it in, in whatever way. But yeah, we're we we we're, we're uh, barring um, a Brexit which completely torches the UK. Um, we're we're going to re-release Unbound at some point soon in a, in like it, in get 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 it all uh, laid out again and then perhaps in a different format. That should be quite nice. And uh, you guys managed to turn a profit and, and do pretty decently with that first run of Unbound and that Kickstarter. Oh, it's all right. Yeah, I think we've yeah, like made some money out of it. Forty grand out of it, I think. Yeah, so like, like we we got forty grand on Kickstarter. Maybe like thirty seven. I forget which. But yeah, it was, wasn't it, forty it, grand worth of profit. It was touch and go. Uh, like we, I don't think we funded until week three, and we had to commission a bunch of extra art to try and get it to try and get uh, support drummed up. Uh, like everything, like Spire, I think funded week two, end of week one. Yeah. Um, but uh, but Unbound was it was touch and go for a while, and we we were discussing like okay, so if this, if this doesn't fund. What do we do? Um, and p- part of the reason that is because Mary has, has such an incredible brain on them uh, that they 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 set the Kickstarter um, funding goal at a, at a point which where we wouldn't get bankrupted uh, if we had if if we had to print the book. And, and, yep. and that's, that's that's kind of a common challenge that a lot of people face. That it's like, well, I I only need I only need uh, seven hundred and fifty pounds. It's like that's absolutely fine as long as this doesn't go well because because at that point, like 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 you might. You you start getting diseconomies of scale and various challenges and like you promise too many things and so Unbound was fairly honestly fairly brisk. I don't think we had that many stretch goals on it either. No. Oh no, we had loads. We didn't hit them. That's right. <laughs> well, no, we we had all the um, extra people, the the famous writers doing the touchstones in the back. Yeah, and we had uh, the two splat books as well. Yeah, mm. we did cyberpunk and urban horror. But it yeah it 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 did okay. Um, a few a few people play it, and occasionally I'll, I'll I'll get people say, "Oh yeah, it's really good, it's really interesting." Uh, and I, I reckon that honestly, anyone who anyone who sits down with session zero for Unbound and plays through it is like, "Holy shit, this game, man!" Because because it, it it empowers players and GMs, and like up you know like the actual game itself is pretty good, but the session zero is top draw. 
honestly, it's like the hidden gem in our catalogue. Mm. Yeah. So would you say Spire was your first big success then? Uh, I think uh, Spire was the first large success, wouldn't you say, Chris? Yeah, like Unbound Unbound existed. Yeah, it worked. And it did, it, it did okay. What's the phrase? It washed its hands? Is that the yeah. one that Mary keeps using? Yeah. Yeah. It justified its existence. Yeah. Um, no, it was the first thing. Um, we had So we had Goblin Quest, which was not kind of published through me and Chris, and that was done, to, we had no means of selling that either. So that's the thing, we didn't have a store um, until it was, uh, Unbound was, uh, it was RP, it was voted RPG of the month on Reddit. And there was this abs- there, there was this sort of absolute hot action terror as Mary was like, we need a fucking website. <laughs> <laughs> we need to sell this to people. Yep. And so that we did, yeah. And so, like, and so, like, we we started putting up, we, and like, and like, we we started putting up on it. Yeah, we started having that, but like, we had no means of selling physical products uh, until Spire came up, and like, from Spire, we we started our own website. We like, we had the means to actually bring in money on a reliable um, rate, rather than like just Kickstarter and like some some pocket change from Itchio. I think the like the other the other sort of like the big success, which is a very small game, was Honey Heist. Honey Heist uh, was a was the, so we, we decided that we put out a well, I um, I decided to put out a, a one page game every month uh, because that was a an achievable goal. And uh, so I think I put out four games through our Patreon before, and they ended up at like thirty six pages, uh, which meant that I was spending more money mailing them out. And honestly, more development time that the Patreon was affording, Patreon was bringing in. And so Honey Heist uh, took off really well. Uh, we got we got a lot of support because it's, 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 it's quite a snacky sell. People are like, oh, cool, I like that, and I want to show my friends. And then um, and this woman called Marisha Ray got in touch. And I was like, I was like, oh, uh, she sent me a DM saying, hi there, girl, I'm interested in playing this. Um, are, are, is there any advice you need that you give for GM? I'm like, oh, she seems nice. Oh, oh what, what's this critical role? And I'd never, I'd never really come up against Critical Role before. I'd, I'd sort of completely stayed, stayed out of it. Um, and like, she was so good about promoting it and saying, "Hi, like, uh, this is the game. This is Grant's Patreon. This is how you can support the game." Um, and like, I think like, I, a, a significant, <laughs> a significant portion of our monthly income is thanks to Marisha Roy, yeah. which I'm endlessly thankful for. Yeah, the Critical Role folks seem very rarely anything but super kind. You know. We've had some good, had some good dealings with them actually. Yeah, they're nice. All right, and so uh, let's move a little bit back into Spire. Could, could you guys kind of discuss its its origins and where it fits in sort of the fantasy game spectrum as to like is it responding to D anD D or is it moving you know into a more narrative space like the early Glorantha stuff? Or... It's Spire is a dark heresy hack. Yeah, right. Like it's actually it's it's actually a hack of. Dark Heresy ran, very early on. <clears throat> I ran Dark Heresy for two and a half years, three years in university, and afterwards uh, Chris was in my game. He played a sister of battle called Malia Magdala, who died jumping off a titan. That's it was, right. Um, it was, I, I, I absolutely adore the Warhammer setting, the 40k setting. I, Chris and I both collect. We don't really play, but we, we build the models and paint them and stuff. Um, and I've always been really, really sort of into the setting. And I think also back then when I was in my mid twenties, I didn't really look at the fascism too closely. Just sort of wackety smackety do. It's kind of fun. And now I'm like, oh, I mean, I don't want to play Inquisitorial Acolytes because they're evil. Well, but, I mean, technically, technically, it is satire. Yeah, I don't think I was. Pl- I wasn't playing it as satire. No, absolutely not. But I'm just saying, yeah. like, I, just think, I, I don't think I was. I don't think I was playing it as like. You know, oh, isn't fascism great either? It's just I, did, I wasn't I wasn't looking at it too closely. Yeah. Anyway, I really like Dark Heresy, and I wanted to try and take the idea of like so the concept of inquisitorial acolytes um, severed from like any sort of support network trying to solve big problems with no resources fascinated me. Um, and I started looking into like spy films and spy games and trying to come to an understanding of how like. Like one of the things which Dark Heresy never really got for me was the idea that you're supposed to be these undercover operatives, but you don't really have any field craft, or like and like, yeah, like you you're in a you're in a giant power armored suit, you know, running around or what have you. But also, like, there's no mechanics for oh, there's very few mechanics for. So here's this person who you're blackmailing into helping you, or here's this person who you don't quite trust, but you're working with them. And there were no real mechanics for that. And also, it was such a difficult game that I think you had a fifteen percent chance of hitting with the average gunshot. 
So it was it was yeah. horrible to horrible to play. Um, three years. Um, and it took you um, too long to work out that it was a fifteen percent chance. Uh, the yeah. next game, Rogue Trader fixes it, uh, and then and then like so there, there was definitely scope creep. So they had Dark Heresy, then Rogue Trader, then the Death Watch for Space Marines, then Black Crusade for Chaos, and then at every point the rules become more playable and more bloated. And yeah, and more bloated and, and like and like technically compatible, but not really. Um, anyway, um, so I really like the idea of playing a shadowy organization within a within a city, within a well, within a hive city, like in forty k, like a big needle coming out of the earth. Um, and I was like, well, I can't just write a dark heresy game. So what if I did dark elves instead? And I think, oh, this was back when I was in Australia. When I was in Australia, I was chatting about having like like the dark elves were this sort of sect of sanctified killers and judges who worked for the high elves in this in this crazy city. And you, it was all about exploiting bonds and trying to stay undercover and like burning your assets, um, like playing some warped inverted kind of paladins in a way. Give yeah, kind change. of. Yeah, yeah, but like, but not not in plate mail. Um, and then uh, seventeen editions later, it's Spire. <laughs> yeah, we changed it pretty early to for, from this kind of like, as you say, paladin mindset into uh, the theory espionage. of revolution. Yeah. yeah, it went from spy to revolutionary. So there's there's still secrecy there, um, but it's much. There's very few like we we have, the mechanics, of of secrecy are boiled down into the resistance system rather than there being specific things, for it. And it's much more about um, what have you got to lose? How could the situation go entertainingly wrong? Uh, than um, than say any sort of, actual representation of overthrowing a city. Because uh, I, th- I think, like, I think, I think, in, in, in a way, we sort of just left that up to the players and the GM because it's really hard to model that without getting very boring. Yeah, getting, like a lot of people have asked for it, but honestly, it would just be so boring. Like both, both to do and to play through that minutiae. There's, there's some, there's some. Like, so in Strata, the, uh, the supplement which we released, uh, Chris and I did a new mechanic called Control, which is a, like a, a sixth resistance which everyone gets but shared amongst the group and that represents how like how your enemies are moving uh, towards you and around you in sort of a broader campaign led way rather than individual incidents and I think like if, if you wanted to have if you want to have something which was more directly representing the city it's very easily adaptable beyond the homebrew did Spire spawn from any other previous work <clears throat> I don't think it did. What about you, Chris? Do you think we were working on anything previous? I, I think I think like like we were working on the previous editions. Yeah, like so because we use iterative design and literally throw out entire systems and completely yeah. restart them. But it lets you build the mechanic and the the style of the system to fit exactly what you're doing. Mm. Like we didn't have this this idea for a rule and then bend everything else around it. We had a world that we wanted to represent and made rules to represent it. So they're tailor-made for it. I will say, it was touch and go. Uh, like there, there was, there was I'm, I'm going to say one playtest session in between Spy being a D20 game and this. Yeah, I'm so we, glad we were really, Yeah, we were really close. And, like it, and like it, used, it used all the similar resistances. It, uses, it used similar... Uh, like it, was, it, was, it was still... It, it wasn't a, a, like a six-stat go and kill things in the dungeon, Gygax would know what it was game, but it was using D20s and it was like, we, like I think like you had to roll against your shadow resistance and various things, but yeah, we the the it's something which I, which I really like doing with Chris, um, which I've not really gotten the, not really gotten the capacity to do it with anyone else, uh, is that we get, we, we, we just fuck about for about three months, maybe four and then we get and so, so by fuck about I mean like we'll we'll throw rules at each other and we'll like we'll look at pictures online and we'll chat about it quietly, and then correct me if I'm wrong here, Chris. We get an understanding of what it is. Yeah, the nugget. The nugget, yes, and it is it is an indefinable center of what the game is, and so um, you run Spire, and if I if I if I, if I put an object in front of you, I could say, is this Spire or is this not Spire? Like, would it fit in with the world? That sort yeah. of thing. And you get to that point with rules and with understanding, and so like we know what Hart's trying to do. Like where we the, uh, initially with Hart, we were really struggling because like, we had different views of how it would work. Um, we had uh, different understandings of what the players were doing, how much the characters wanted, how much we wanted the characters to suffer and get hurt, how much introspection we wanted, and then eventually over six months and a lot of drafts and like shuffling around, 
we hit the point where we're like, yeah, okay, this is what heart is. And then once you hit that point, the rules, you can start crowbarring out the rules and the names stay in place. Um, <clears throat> and then, like, f so from that point, we know that the Vermissian Knights say we want them to have a pathfinding ability. And so while we're in while we're in sketch mode, we write down major ability, pathfinding, and then there's um, be better at fighting, be better at healing, be better at standing still. Yeah, we put in um, a lot of stuff that just says like attacking plus one. Chris now, rules now here. The, the, the entire the entire system might not use modifiers, mm. but all that means is that we know that a plus one is attacking better. Question mark. Yeah, Chris really likes to throw in plus ten. Yeah, plus ten. No, plus ten is is extreme. He loves that. It always scares me whenever I see him. Oh God, how am I going to fit ten into the system? But yeah, it's, it's not. So with that being said, I mean, are you guys big fans of sort of the math side of game design? All the bell curves and you know. I fucking hate maths. Oh, oh all right, all right. I, I can't stand them. Like I have, um, I can't remember the name of it. Dis discount Coolio. I can't add up. I'm rubbish. Discal at it. Discount Coolio. Dis discount Coolio. Dyslexia. Discal for the discount Killer. That's it. Yeah, a lot. I like the Discount Coolio character. Yeah, he's pretty radical. Anyway. Um, I can't do the maths, and it all goes funny when I try and look at it. I get really bored. He gets I get bored. Really, I get really <laughs> bored trying to do. It. I, I, like, I, I. Every time I run a game, I write. I change it because it isn't going fast enough. That is, that is an actual rule. Uh, it's it's an, a, a genuine habit I do. I'll just start filing off the. I'll, I'll, I'll start like soaring off all my systems in like in flight to make them do what I want. To the point that you're no longer playing the system anymore. Absolutely not. No, which is um, you know the sort of thing which I'm sure the HGO crowd would really enjoy from a from a theoretical point of view. I get so bored with maths, and as as, as I was saying earlier about about the crisps and cheese, if that bit made it in, I do smoke weed. <laughs> and so, and so, at certain po at a certain point on game nights, basic maths becomes something I really don't want to try and do. The math is just boring. It's it boring, is, isn't it? It really is. Let me tell a story. Well, okay. one of the, one of the things is like you talk about numbers. If you look at a, if you look at the classes inspire, and you look at like the, the actual like stat blocks, what they get, like what resistance free slots they get, and that sort of things. If you if you look at them carefully, you can add those all up to ten. They're all translatable into numbers and they all add up to 10 because it's the only way that I could work out if they were balanced. They, there's really simple blocks of maths through it and um, like flavor stuff got translated into a number to give it a value and then it mm. added up to 10. Yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> That's how I designed most of the numbers. I think there was there was a, it was a, it was a fascinating bit on the back when before we had the Discord, we had a spy Reddit, which is still sort of knocking around, but no one really uses it. It's not it's not the best format for the discussion. Mm. Um, and this guy, uh, is this, this this chap posted a uh, a class. He'd, I think I think he'd made he made a chronomancer class about like about messing with the flow of time, the perception of time. And someone was like, "Oh, um, how?" Uh, someone asked, "How did you make the class? How do you ensure it's balanced?" And, he, and he's like, "Oh, well, Chris and Grant did this with the classes." And I was like. Oh shit! We did do this with the classes. I didn't realize that we had a pattern. Decoded my system. Yeah, like, like I, I, a system which I didn't know I was cell. using. Yeah, yeah, like it's not, it's not like incredibly deeply hidden. But he'd written it out word for word, like exactly how to decipher the system. Even things which we hadn't planned for, like the um, like okay, so like they get one weapon, which is either which is D three with a positive tag, uh, or D six with a negative tag. I was like, oh God, they do get that, don't they? Yep. Yeah, like it's not it's not hidden away. It's just not mentioned. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about the origins of the Alefear mask stuff. Does it come from like that Green Chan Vortex a long time ago? Come as a mask's origin source for the elves or Why do we just think masks are cool? Yeah, I mean it it started off as like fifty percent badge of honor and fifty percent a way to hide drow in Yeah in high elf society. That's so, basically it. Like it, we gave, we gave the evil overseers um, an incredibly easily exploitable weakness, and and like and like the fact that like we can tell, we, we're not sure whether we say it right, but <clears throat> elves will often talk directly. Like, Elfir will talk directly to a mask, and like and like if someone's wearing the mask, they assume that's the person, and it's kind of a weird sort of social mental block they have. So it so it just means that you can go and play up in the Elfir, and it's not like how oh, you're a drow. Fuck off. 
you can get past that bit. I, I think we explicitly say at some point like 15, 20% of the elf population are drow. I think it's, yeah. Yeah, it, mean, it means that you can just assassinate somebody, put on their mask and go, there's a dead man here, clean him away. <laughs> and that's fine. You can do that. You know, I don't think, I've, I don't think I've ever had a player group try that, Chris. That's well, crazy. Your, your players are lazy. In terms of the in terms of the overall fashion as well, in spite like so fashion something which uh, fascinates me, uh, and the Devil Wears Prada is a film which Chris really likes. Hell yes, it's astonishing. I mean, it's... all the characters in Devil Wears Prada are in Spire. You just have to find them. <laughs> yeah, so they're all so they're they're all through the works, and all the papers are the all the Devil Wears Prada characters. Yeah, we're big fans of that. Uh, and so, like, so, like, the, like the initial idea for the game was, I think hats, dark glasses, dark glasses, scarves, and coats are cool. How can I come up with a game where we're allowed to run that? And I sort of married that to dark heresy. And so, and so, like, like the primary reason why Drow are burnt by sunlight uh, is because I think hats are cool. And like, I, I think, I think uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 all and like and like the fact that. It, it becomes this incredibly cruel thing that the Elfie are sending them off to a desert war when they're hurt by sunlight. But that's that's all just an afterthought. Yeah, I just I just think I, I think um I, I I grew up watching Helsing, and AD, AD's done such a great job with that as well. Uh, Adrian Stone, the the artist. Yeah, and like like fashion plays such a big part of Spire in in the contrasts. Like the drow look like a lot of. Um, like leather and belts and that sort of sneakier end of the spectrum, this more mundane, hard-worn clothing. And then the Alpha are in extreme high couture. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and sort of getting into that sort of the, the differences between the ancestors as presented, do you guys want to start to get into a little bit of that? Sort of what your approach was, especially in the kind of the tumultuous TRPG scene we world, in, world we live in with the orc conversation and uh, kind of all that complicated stuff about race and ancestry. Uh, what was kind of your approach uh, coming into Spire? So, firstly, the entirety of Spire was hit with a sensitivity reader. Yeah, we knew real early on that we were we were walking some lines here, <laughs> um, being middle class white dudes. Yeah. Um, so it, it was it was heavily sensitivity read. Um, but honestly, we just kind of presented the situation. Rather than um, actively making commentary in a lot of places, we just presented the situations and leave it to the players to, to work out. Um, like the, if you look at the, the sort of the weirder stuff of the, in quotation marks, bloodline of the drought, the fact that they lay eggs, the fact that they're burnt by the sun, those are not innate to their race. But- Biology, yeah. Yeah, they're not part. Then that's not part of their biology. That is, that's added later. That's not evolution. That's not who they are necessarily. That has all been added later chronologically. Can you remember why we gave them the egg laying thing? I have to piss off that one guy in the Discord. I think he was really. Yeah, yeah we we do, when we would double down on it. Up, up. <clears throat> you seem to think we put it in so they couldn't be crossbreeding, and I, I think we just put it in because it was weird. We put it in because. There's there's a lot of... First off, it was about the midwife class. Mm. It, it kind of gave them a nice origin story. It also lets player characters legitimately, if they want to, have children. Because one of the problems oh, if, yeah, you, if, if, you, if you have a, a, three, a D&D 3.5 adventure going on, there's nine months where that person can't adventure, really. <laughs> because you're not going to fit in your armour... You probably don't want to, you know, damage a child in any way. So you kind of separate the system out. Um, but also it centralized it. Yeah, the community and it, aspect. It gave another point of control to the elf here in a really mm. icky way. And it, it's mm. tended and it's, yeah. And you get the kind of, we get a class that's very much Den Mother. Mm. And, but Den Mother to like a community rather than just their own. Um, so there were a lot of bonuses to it. Sort of um, a dominatrix murder librarian. Yeah, ours is a kind of dominatrix murder Shinto priestess. Oh, that's that, that's a nice term. I like that. That's sexy. Oh, I mean, better. I think as far as the as far as like the race stuff goes, I've been against I've been against the idea of um, canonically evil races for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I think it's lazy, uh, and like and like like I. 
I'm not averse to combat in role-playing games at all. My players seem to be, which is strange. They'll try and befriend every skeleton I put forth. But the the understanding that here are some people who it is okay to kill it isn't okay for me. Um, like that's something which I think we need to have a look at in in our in our in our role-playing games because like it, like if you can show the orcs doing evil shit, fine. That's okay. Like, like these these are bad people, and we need to stop them doing bad things. Okay, that's that. We, we we want to stop them doing bad things, but having the fact that 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 an orc, right as it comes out of the womb, or however orcs are born, um, is is innately evil, um, really speaks to a uh, like. It's like it's like evil just means anti-state in a lot of the way. And like and like like there's there's a lot of stuff bound up with the idea of civilization and colonialism, which people far more um, skilled than me and more ca- uh, capable than me have spoken about. But the the biggest thing which we want to do with Spire is that everyone's a person, um, and that are... that runs through most of our games. Actually, if you look at things mm. like Unbound as well, most of the the adversaries list. You will note that we almost always tag them adversaries, not monsters. Mm. Um, are human. Esque, so they're humanoids. There, because it, it matters when you kill a human. Yeah, like none of them are uh, are identifiably identifiably goblins, mm. right? That like these trash creatures that you just stab. Um, in Spire, we have the Gutterkin, but there's no stats for Gutterkin. Uh, is there like a point of origin for Gutterkin? They're kind of peculiar in in the world. It's it's because I wanted to put goblins in the game, and Chris wouldn't let me. Yeah, it's literally that. <laughs> That's it, yeah. That's it. So like, we can't have goblins. All right, well, I'm going to get them in. Yeah, they're just these little small things like... Greasy um, humanoids. Yeah, like um, completely bald crows and things like that that are vaguely yeah. intelligent. Yeah. Um, and so, like, I, 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 the, the the thing with the elf here as well, which I wanted to present, is that it's not... We hint at the fact that maybe, like, like the north are up they go, the more sane they become, or, like, the less cruel they become. But really, I think that we've been chatting about some sort of hive mind thing we get to in the strata, and the fact that, like, the warmer their brains become, the less unhinged they become. And I think what we what we wanted to get, like, the the ideal ending of a Spire campaign for me um, is... So it's a, it's a, a spoilers for Idol on Sky. Um... Which is which is one of our campaigns. So if you're playing Idol on Sky, I don't know, put some wax in your ears for, for five minutes, a, a minute even. But the uh, the 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 main antagonist in Idol on Sky is basically a magician with leukemia. Um, and in the in the in the campaign that I ran, um, the players uh, held her son at gunpoint and then drowned her in a bath. And that is and that is and that is like. Perfect. That's people. That's people killing each other. It's not. It's not some sort of grand wizard battle, and that 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 really matters. Like like it's 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 like if if you, you can like the violence in Spire is really supposed to matter, and it's supposed to be grotty. Yeah, very unpleasant, like, difficult. Like that same campaign, the end of mine. It was basically like oh god, the yeah. the, the ending was was brutal, and it was over in seconds. Like normally, yeah. when you have this this huge arc of a campaign, the the ending session is this huge bombastic thing, right? It's like oh, the the you you have a massive fight against the dragon. You go home to to bells and whistles. The the entire last scene lasted roughly eight seconds real time. I think it's the yeah. There's they just got, they got another spy black and, and and ended up accidentally detonating it, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. They detonated yeah. spy black and like the it just it went out. It it. it blew up an area, and it was yeah. over, mm. and it was hollow. The entire victory was hollow. So many people lost their lives, both sides, while half of the players were addicted to something or another. <laughs> like, because there's a lot of there's a lot of drug metaphors in that. Um, actual, both actual drugs and, like, demonology as addiction. In, in that, there's the third sister, and one of our players was addicted fourth. to the third... Fourth sister, sorry. Um, and the other character, the characters were addicted to to Drek and the Minotaur <laughs> stuff and sulfur, and it was just it was just grubby. And like the people that survived went home. That's the end. It's, it's it's very it's it's perhaps below bittersweet. Yeah, the end of a spy campaign, and it has this it has this tremendous capacity for this like absurdity and I think humor. Like there's like, there's a there's a definitely uh, there's humor throughout the book, and there's a lot of opportunity to laugh at how weird these elf are and how nuts they are and how, how ridiculously cruel the situation is 
Um, and then I think at the end of every, of every spy campaign, unless unless the GM sort of fudges it around, yeah, it's horrible. I mean, if you take the the end of my Kings of Silver campaign, which was probably the longest running single game I did as part mm. of play tests, that ended with one character going into a burning building where the mm. um, the adversary was the main character, main adversary was dying. So he's dying inside a burning building. Mm-hmm. He's gone. He goes in to finish the job mm. and dies in there as well. Absolutely, thanks. I'll have that. Like, he was slamming this man's head into a burning <laughs> desk and went down with the building. <laughs> like, yeah, it was it was so grotty and it was perfect. I think having, I think, like, violence is... Violence is, is uh, like, sudden, sudden unpleasant violence is something which I really treasure in a role-playing game. And, like, not every role-playing game. And, like, and like in d and I want lots of, like, oh, he hits your shield, and you fall over, and, oh, you're winded, and you parry, chang, 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 and the shock runs down your arm. And Inspire is, like, okay, they're definitely shitting themselves when they die. And, like, and like we... And, like, and like when, like, we go... Like, that's the thing. We, we didn't want to come across as too edgy in the book. It's really hard to, to strike that balance. But in our home games, it's much worse than the book. A lot worse. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is gr- much grimmer in our home it's games. Very, un- very unpleasant. In, in in Spire, like one of the first combats in my Kings of Silver campaign happened uh, in a basement. They got set upon by a load of people with two by fours, just mm. lumps of wood. They nearly all died. They're, they're all they're all nobles in Kings of Silver, aren't they? So they're yeah. all, they're all posh. I think aside from the, the there's a um, duelist and Lejeune. things like that. But they got yeah. they they got jumped in the dark. <laughs> And the only the only way they got out of it was by taking like huge amounts of fallout and then setting the the body of the one person they had that they'd taken down on fire to show how serious they were and then leaving. Like that's it. Yeah. It's so, a, yeah. it's it's a fundamentally unpleasant game, Spy. It's a cruel game in a lot of ways that Heart isn't. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Heart is very often a surprisingly triumphant game for like the content. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah, so uh, speaking of heart, I'm I'm curious your thoughts on, especially in Spire's context, taking that heart idea of playing other races and bringing it up into Spire, particularly the ale fear. Um, we have a we have an ale fear in Swan Dive, of course, uh, Willow, but uh, you know she's taking not exactly the, the exact normal ale fear approach. Did you ever c- c- consider allowing for uh, other ancestries in Spire? Uh, in particular, the ale fear, of course. No, oh. we we never we never do it because it's just simply for um, we don't let you play oppressors. Yeah, yeah, of course, not not necessarily you know spire ale fear, but like ale fear outside of the spire context, maybe. No, that's that's, that's fair. Like your game, the, your way of doing it, but we didn't want to normalize yeah. playing the oppressor. Uh, of course, of course. I I think I think like spires spires also propaganda. Is the other thing like spire is written from the point of view of the drow, and heart isn't. So like that's, that's the thing. Like I suppose it's, it's like it's quite hard to come at stuff canonically, especially in a role playing game where the actual experience people get is um, we write a system and a setting, and then the GM reads the setting, and then the system with the players generates the world. So that is like four or five steps removed from from us, which makes it really hard to establish uh, truth. And like you can do things like uh, what was it? There was the chat on the Discord yesterday. Like, do drow have nipples? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, they have one big tit in the middle. That's my that's my official ruling. Uh, that they uh, like a cow, one one big tit, and they um, like we can't we can't really if we establish one thing that it's going to get in people's way. It's it's it's, it's going to start um, causing problems. So Spire is, I suppose, in retrospect, uh, written from the point of view that they'll fear are. Oh, Awful, they're awful, terrible bastards who do murder operas and games that take place in Spire are through that lens. You're working for these bad guys who are the Ministry, but they're better than the other bad guys. So it goes on. And Heart is, I think, is not about that. Heart, like, like the fact that the Elf, that the Elfia are evil, isn't necessarily as true in Heart as it is in the in the world of Spire. And that's kind of that's kind of wobbly to get around. Yeah, we- uh, but it's a, it's a different perspective. One thing we also found out very early on in our game design career is that if you name um, something very simply, people will latch onto it. Like we had a power in Unbound, I think it was called Sniper, 
and mm. we had to change the name because everybody took it because they just went, "Oh, I'm a sniper character now." It was too clear. It was like having a, it's like having a pair called yeah. Batman. Yeah, why wouldn't I be Batman? That, that's just how it works, right? Yeah, and it, it like it wasn't a very good power, but everybody took it because it had the most easily recognizable name. Yeah, and it, it and like in a class in an almost classless game, it gave you something to. And what it to what it onto. did was it entered the sort of the collective unconscious of the people playing that sniper was just the one you took. And if we put playable Elphir in the core book, then it would lessen the Elphir's sort of evilness and horror. Also, people never asked to say, oh, hey, is it all right if we play Elphir who are, who are revolutionaries? So, like, uh, people like Elphir who are, who are against the, 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 the general structure and are working with the, with, the, uh, with the ministry. People were like, oh, can we play the Paladins? No. What? No. Go play a different game, you weird fascist! <laughs> you missed something, buddy. <laughs> like, entirely. Yeah. But there are, you know, non-aligned Elphir in the Spire, like the Cow's Udder Elphir. Oh, God, that, oh, that name. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> it was difficult to fit oh. in, but I, I'm really happy with God, it. God, I love him. I adore him. Yeah, so it was a, it's a backer who, go, who goes by Cow's Udder. And he wanted his name in the book, and we were like, jeez, we're going to have to do some fucking Karma Sutra on this one to get it in. <laughs> no, it, it absolutely worked. And the joke at the end about him, like, nobody needs to tell him, please don't tell him what a cow's udder is, please, please. Don't. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, I, think, I think we hit that in Strata. Like, we've got a lot more options around, uh, especially in like, the Ambrant section of Strata, about, like, so if you want to have Elphia who are, who are sort of allied to the revolution in some way, what do you want to mm-hmm. focus on? And the fact that they treat it as this sort of, oh, what a jolly game, I shall fund this revolutionary cell. Of course, it's never really their story. And it's super important to remember that even if you're there and you're going to tell those kind of stories, is are they fetishizing mm. the rebellion? You yeah. know, Are they using those stories for their own gain or their own sense of mm. performative justice? You know, performative justice. Uh, and yeah, and but still humanizing yeah. to me is important because uh, everybody's a human and you never want to just have people that are, you know, cruelly, one-sidedly murderable. Yeah, that, that that's why in the adversary chapters you'll notice that everybody's got a name because you because uh, because as you knock that man's teeth out, I want you to read his name tag and to see yeah. his surname and to think of his kids. Yeah, that's the thing. You, yeah. you you make everybody a living, breathing creature. Like this, it could be really interesting to to take to take an like an elf here who is trying to rebel against this and trying to understand that okay, like this what I've been sold from. What I've been sold from birth isn't ideal, and I have to do things which are very scary and dangerous to me. And and if I get found out, like the social exile will be worse than any sort of death that they, they, could, they could visit upon me. And I think you've got like you've got some fun stuff you could explore, that, and the fallibility of that, you know, and like the difficulty of, of, of the two cultures trying to connect. I think there's some interesting stories. Yeah, and can you but can you imagine how long the book would be if we tried to explain our way through oh, all yeah, of that? Yeah. That is that is a Kickstarter unto itself. <laughs> like, <laughs> Right, like it would have to be a yeah. whole separate supplement just to make it, yeah. it 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 work properly, and it's easier to just not present that as an option, and then let you do it personally rather than put it into that collective unconscious and go, yeah, you can play oppressors, that's great. We want to present a strong theme, and you can do what you wish with the game afterwards. Of course, of course. Uh, always hope to you know maintain that spirit of canonicity and all that good stuff, and uh, yeah, maintain the spirit of the game, not represent oppressors in a, in a positive light. No, thank you. Uh, it, okay, and, and moving on to a little bit more world building stuff. Do you, do you guys have like a particular name you refer to this collective world as? Because I mean, we've referred to it as Destera. I guess the world of Destera makes sense, but Destera, of course, being like the land around the spire. You know? oh. But still, I tend to just default to Destera. So do we, honestly. Um, no, we don't. We don't have a term for the world. We had well, like, like, <clears throat> Destera is. Um, I think Destera was one of the last things we put in the book, because we were like, cause, like, we'd written the whole book and we'd named the noble houses, um, and and we was, we'd done the descriptions and we were like, okay, so like, so, so like Destera, we figured were the rulers who capitulated. That's fine. Okay, we we'll go from there, and then, um, we just kind of didn't. Didn't like that. We had names for places around the spire, but not names for what it was. Not names for the land that it's in, and so we ended up with Destera, which is a which is a fight name as any. But um, I think it might have been, might have been nice to have something a bit more, you know, front of booky. <laughs> One of the things we wanted is we wanted to point out that it's about spire, 
Like it's about that specific location and other locations have an effect on Spire and they get people go there, come back from there, whatever. But we're not talking about uh, a wilderness game. We're not talking about like uh, the West Marches style thing where you go and travel. It's all within this city. And kind of detailing the area immediately outside Spire in any, in any, to any great level would have given people the opportunity to leave. Yeah, which we which we don't yeah, have the rules. We didn't for. want them to, so we just went. No, nah, we don't need to yeah. explain it. And like you've got places like White Cross um, and the other areas, yeah. but they're they're so removed. So, has there mm. ever been any design talk or intention of, of doing any sort of supplemental stuff to, to explore the some of this outside worlds, like the new job front or something like that? So, so um, Spire is was in <laughs> is and was in our head part of a quadrilogy. Um, so what have we got? We've got Spire, Heart, Cross, uh, and Dust. Listeners, I'm having to redub this, so um, instead of reenacting the noises I made after uh, after Chris said this, I just, I'm going to leave that to your imagination. Thank you for your understanding. Yeah, so the and honestly, like this is one of those things of, we don't know when we're going to have a chance to do these things. Um, but there's, yeah, so there's the idea was that the, the cross is white cross and dust is the new Jap front. White cross, the, the white cross game is kind of merging a little bit into some other, like some, some, <laughs> some other stuff that we're doing at the moment, which maybe we'll talk about later. Basically at, at present we're, we're, we're at a crossroads, um, in our, in our design work. And we're working out if we, if the next, next big thing we write is in Desterra or the lands around it, or what have you, or if we go and explore a new world. I'm trying to I'm trying to work out how much I can say because, like, well, that's, that's, okay. So, so um, I think I, th- I think that like we're we're like we're, let's talk about it freely, but with with the understanding that none of this is final and all of this is yeah, in like our heads. Literally, none of this is. We written have, we have down. nothing written down. Yeah, yeah. This is this is something which we think it would be fun yeah. to do. Yeah. So the idea is that you would be playing in part of the Njab Front where. The, um, a load of the conduits got activated at once. What you're looking at is you're looking at the eye of the storm of the world's largest incursion. So are you in danger? Like, are you in a fracture in like another part of the like the, the universe? Well, no. So, so you've got it, this central. No, no it's got, safe. It's perfect. It's in theory perfectly safe. So you've got um, a mapped known area, and everything outside of that is whirling demonic occur- incursion. So you can't leave. And the f- the further you go out, the the, m- the more messy it becomes. And your your unit is stranded within the eye of the storm, and it's about territory so, control and yeah. uh, diplomacy within this limited area with other people who are trapped. We figure it would be um, like a, a, a mercenary unit of um, ex ex soldiers from the Elf- uh, from the from the Drow armies, some Nulls, some human mercenaries as well, because we've got that established. Um, and it would be about like trying to carve out your section of of, of of dust, which is the name for the area. So you're going to be like able to uh, escape or anything like that, or like make it out of the storm, or is it just about sort of control? No, 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 no. And, and like and like and like, and like, well, like you you can walk off into the dust if you like, and and maybe you got out, but no one comes back. And we we want to sort of like uh, it's almost a bit like um, uh, this war of mine. Um, that sort of like like the sort of Stalingrad bleak. And the other one is Cross, which is short for White Cross, which we have been trying to write for oh, four, for three years. And so, what time. precisely so is White Cross? Sort of, it's one of the arcologies, and it's filled with like abandoned vaults and uh, sort of like treasures to it's be hunted. Monsters. And... The big key, the big key with White Cross is that it's everybody's left. It's yeah, just rubbish, right? Like it's it's Middle Age England now um because all of the all of not the middle ages you mean middle aged yeah. right yeah okay cool um yeah. like it's all, all of the cool scientists and everybody have got what they wanted from the archaeologies and left they've gone to spire where people are paying them money so it's just mm. you in the dirt with these awful monsters trying to scavenge for some technology and keep your little communities alive um, uh, when, mm. and we were going to draw on an awful lot of um, old English folklore for the monsters. Yeah, um, and so like, like 
somewhere between The Witcher and Monster Hunter as well in terms of hunting them for parts and trying to trying to defend what you've got and, and also talking about like a much less cosmopolitan religion or talk about um, wilderness and we had there's some cool ideas for the way in which like the way in which religion the way in which folk uh, folklore was going to be drummed up there uh, but it turns out it's really hard to write a monster hunting system in the resistance game because yeah. uh, it's such an abstract combat I think like heart we we learned a lot about uh, how to play with the resistance system through heart and I feel a bit more confident doing it now um, but the idea of monster hunting were splitting out into a couple of other things which we're working on. Uh, but those are those are very loose. Yeah, but as, as, as we say, like at the moment, there is we have not yeah. written these down. Even this is just stuff in our nothing head. written down. This is this is some ideas that we could that we think would be fun to write and profitable. Of course, but I mean, thank you for sh- for sharing that to begin with. I mean, seriously, it's an incredible honor, and I'm sure more people than just me are going to be really, really freaking excited to just hear those ideas being floated. Um, okay, so uh, would you mind answering a few questions about? sort of the world-building core of Destera, the world of Destera. Uh, in particular, like, a lot of conversation these days, I think after writers like Brandon Sanderson, uh, about hard world-building versus soft world-building, um, you know, rigidly defining the parameters of the world you're presenting to the players versus expecting a lot of these little side angles and stuff to be filled back in by the imaginations of the players and, and the GM collectively. Um, and I think Destera is really interesting because I think, you know, the magic tends to lean into this belief stuff, you know, um, it's particularly like King Grist and Derelictus and sort of how the, the cannibals believing in him gives him this magic. Um, so yeah, I was just curious how you guys saw that sort of thing and what your approach was in terms of that world-building spectrum. Um, in particular, yeah, the magic and how the gods and, and, and the abilities people have work. Oof, that's a big question, isn't it? Do you know the answer? Kind Chris? of. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thanks for the best way of putting it. So oh, one good. of the things that we absolutely hate is when we open a role-playing book and there's a fucking timeline in it. <sighs> right? Like, yeah, the second you start getting to that level of detail, I switch the hell off. It's just so boring. Because it doesn't matter to your it's, game. It's not useful. So yeah. what we tried to include was all of the useful stuff. Stuff that you could turn into an adventure. Stuff that you go, oh, that's that's inspiring as an NPC. And the actual cause of magic isn't immediately useful. It's not. It's not a thing that you can base an adventure off within seconds, mm-hmm. right? So we just kind of didn't do it. Um, But honestly, most, I mean, you're not far off with how we think about magic most of the time, like belief powers magic. Um, There is, there is some other place that it comes from and you can channel it with belief or ritual or right. But I think we're more on the will than the way. It's also more fluid. It's, it's also because we both read uh, Unknown Armies at the same time and never really got over it. Have you not? Absolutely. Go and read Unknown Armies. Oh, Oh, mate. Oh, Jesus, yeah, like, like, get get rid of the spire nonsense. Um, get is, uh, pick pick up the second edition of Unknown Armies. Uh, first one's fine. Third one is also good. You want the second one, uh, which was released around the turn of uh, around 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 two thousand, I think, like late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, it has the most intoxicating way of uh, representing magic I have seen in a game. It is absolutely so, so. So, like the Inksmith, for example, is an Unknown Armies class that snuck into a different game. I mean, just just to give you some idea of how much this has inspired us. So there's the the Stolzians, um in the in the in the um, Silver Quarter. The, these luck priests. Uh, the writer of Unknown Armies is Greg Stolze. He has written several books about luck priests, um, and they have entropomancers in Unknown Armies who get magical power by taking risk. The more mm-hmm. risk they take, and the more. Um, dangerous it is and the more they have to lose on that risk the more power they get so if they want an like an incredible like they, they need to do an incredible spell on somebody far away put one bullet in a revolver spin it and try and shoot themselves if it, if it if it clicks and doesn't shoot them they just suddenly get this burst of magic that they can then use because they took a huge risk and stolzians are luck priests like our, all of our games have always been infused with this devotion to unknown armies the the principle of uh, of magic as a reflection of society and 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 and, and the sort of accepted beliefs um and i think i think like the the redesign of unknown armies um it updates it to uh, to the to, to the modern era and it doesn't it doesn't quite gel as well for me it doesn't quite sing i think mechanically it's a stronger game but um something about the way in which it manages to encapsulate 1998 mm. in 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 a magic system is incredible 
but yes, go read it, buy it, find a copy, get a PDF. I would also like to just officially uh, mention that um, uh, Terry Pratchett is the other um, main inspiration. So uh, Chris hasn't read a lot of Pratchett. Like four or five books. Um, uh, four or five books. I've, I've pretty much read the whole lot, I think, several times over. Um, and like Pratchett's insistence that everyone is people... Um, and also Pratchett's insistence, uh, Pr- Pratchett's idea that uh, the gods are formed from belief, um, uh, uh, spoken small gods. Uh, that has uh, oh, and also um, the the fairies, the lords and ladies from the book Lords and Ladies. They're just the elf here. I just stole them. <laughs> I, I put them in the living room. Like yeah, um, Pratchett's Pratchett's view of uh, of this sort of. Not kind, but humanist fantasy, which is not about big stories, which is about the like. If, if there is a big story, is how it impacts small people, and that that for me is a much more interesting and relatable story. Because I never tried to save the world, but my mum's been ill before, and I can tell a story about someone's someone's ill ill mum, even if that's about oh, and my mum's my mum's trying to save the world or whatever. Well, I mean, also just just where magic from the real world comes in, right? Like if you look at all the the religious magical systems that exist. They all rely on belief. I think actually, actually, come to think of it, that's how we like, we wrote the, when we started writing the magic system for Spire. So we used to have a separate magic system. Um, like we we used to have a spell book broadly, and then you got access to spells through your class. And then we realised that it was more interesting just to wrap everything into the class. Um, but all of the um, like we started, it was back back when oh, what's it called the, the Temple Sinister? Mm-hmm. Back when the ministry was called the Temple Sinister. Um, we had it was the Temple Sinister and the Temple Dexter, and we realized, oh, oh, okay, we can't call it that because that sounds like the serial killer. I will make sure to sneak in a joke of Swan Dive of some idiot calling uh, accidentally the Ministry the Temple Sinister. <laughs> 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 that's that's from the old editions, but um, um, they all of the all of like the the Ministry spells and the I think that they, we had some carrion priest stuff, some Azrite stuff, but we wanted them to be um, sort of hacked interpretations of religious rites. So like uh, what is it? Like uh, the rite of silver sanctuary uh, for the Lejeune, uh when you like you anoint the walls with silver to ward people from coming in. That is you can imagine people doing that at the start of a ceremony before the chat before the before the service happens as like we're we're making this space sacred so we can worship here. And we wanted, to, we wanted to take it away from, I'm going to throw a bolt of light out of my hand because I need to do damage to more sort of, well, okay, like, we've got this world which you can explore. What is ritually happening? What, like, why has this spell been developed? What, like, what, what are they trying to, what problems are they trying to solve with this belief? Yeah, it's such a fantastic way of looking at magic, especially like connecting it to like actual anthropological history and the histories of, of people and, and their own culture. Uh, so speaking of sort of spells and, and the contextual way we look at magic and spire, um, I, you know, I think it's pretty obvious uh, with you talking about the spell book, um, with all the extra advances in spire, where all those kind of spells went. I'm curious if any of that development ever happened with the heart, like if you guys ever had some extra advances lying around you, you wanted to make and that just never made the cut. Oh, they were really hard. Yeah, it's just, just hard. <laughs> well, I, I think like, um, like I, I think you've you, you got it right there because Spire is so uh, deeply baked into the setting and the specific world of Spire. Even though everyone's own Spire is different, that's you know it's all baked in. The um, we had things which we wanted to explore mechanically because that's how you, that's the best way you can give players a means of interacting with them, whether that's through stats for adversaries or through you know um, uh, abilities which you can pick up. And in heart, everything we tried writing, it they were all basically prestige classes or like variants of existing classes, and it yeah. just felt it, it felt like well, actually, this is just a, this is just refluffing at this point. Like we could, we obviously we had for like it was like a, like a living reliquary, I think, where you sort of like you you acquired um, parts of the moon, uh, p- p- part, uh, parts of the moon belief faith, uh, and then sort of walked around bearing it. And it's like oh, you just do that with a heretic class. I just think yeah. that, like, like we'd like we'd explored as much as we wanted to within those um, classes, which are also much broader, I think, than the classes in Spire in terms of what they can do. Oh, absolutely. And and also because we have such a we we abstract so much in our system, uh, like we have very little in the way of like moving parts in in, in the resistant system, which means it's quite hard to write your classes because there's only, there's only so many things you can mess. Of with. course. Uh, and that brings us to uh, sort of one of the, let's call it a controversy of heart, but uh, 
One of the points of contention was the development of uh, Burned and Broken, a, a supplement that was initially uh, told to be like a, a direct conversion guide for classes, but ended up being something different, albeit far more suited to the products uh, in, in question. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? So one of the things we didn't want to do at any point, really, was a conversion guide between Spire and Heart. Well, well, I mean, because... we did say we were going to. Yeah, but we didn't want to. Okay. Um, because Spire characters are not Heart characters. They're, they're different. They're different, right? There's a different emphasis. Mm. There's a different skill set. And if you take a spy character and put them in heart, they fucking die. It's, like it's, that's it, right? They just die. They're not ready for this. And like, and like, and like, you can like, we've got quite a big chapter on the heart in Spire and some NPCs and stuff. And cool, okay, go down into it and see how bad it is down there and how far out you are, how far out of your element you are, and then leave. You know, go down and get whatever it was you wanted, and that's fine. But people kept asking for it. People were like, "What? Like, is this is this an expansion for Spire? Am I going to be able to?" It's because I think that there's there's a real desire to have everything hang together. There's the, like like the um, uh, a, a chap who hired us for uh, to, to, to do some licensed work uh, was talking about how really what sells well in terms of licensed role playing games is big encyclopedias detailing everything and putting stats on it. Because yeah. at that point you can see how strong that thing is from the comic book and how strong that guy is from the movie. You can sort of have it all held in your head. It's the secret guide to everything. And um, Heart is, Heart is, as Chris was saying, it's a very different game from Spire, but people were keen to have the, the idea. I don't think there's that many ongoing Spire games who were interested in transitioning into Heart. I don't think that's actually a thing which is occurring. But but people people were people were asking for it. And I think that we realised like quite early on like in the Kickstarter, we were like... Oh, someone's going to do a bad version if we don't do it. Um, and we, I think I think we also kind of discovered that, because I, I, I was doing some tooling around before we hit the Kickstarter, we were seeing if it was possible. I think I've got the Bound and the Azerite done as heart classes, and they suck. They're not fun, yeah. they're not fun classes to play, they don't really make any sense. Because, because like, yeah, like what's the thing? Like, like okay, so so, so like like the perch guy is uh, the the bound is fine for you know exploring things and going and climbing around. They're pretty good at that, but they're about perch. They're about they're about like the Shinto esque small gods religion and the vigilantism and appearing uh, as if from nowhere. Um, it, it, in the middle of a conversation between between two NPCs, the GM carelessly had while they were sitting around the table, and. And and like that's what their class is about, and it's not about going down into heart. And so like after like we did some classes, we we had a go. We tried doing like a ready reckoner, as it were, to sort of say, well, you can sort of fudge it over this way, and that's fine. We couldn't come up with a good one. It it wasn't it wasn't fun to write or read or I presume play. So I mean, like, I I kind of like the route we took, where you you become a heart class, you become mm. something that's more suited to where you are. And you get to do the whole sort of like getting the getting the hell out of dodge story, which I really like, like like fleeing down through Spire, and we focus more on Derelictus and got the yeah, capacity to being that, like, you're being chased out. Hearts more OSR inspired. Yeah. Um, it's like it, originally it was like, what if we did if we did dungeon crawls, but in our in our world is how Heart came about. Like mm. the the Spire characters, like not a single one of their abilities is tuned to that. No. It was like it was. It was a real. It was a real challenge to try and get out. And I think we we wouldn't. It wasn't possible to please everyone uh, through doing that. And I think that we we made the choice that rather than doing a a product which we weren't super happy with, which would also just which would also as well be kind of twelve new hard classes which weren't very good. <laughs> that's more than that's more than there are in the book. And so what we ended up with uh, for anyone who hasn't read it, he's listening to the podcast, um, was this sort of sawn off heart character with these very basic abilities which meant we got to riff on the ideas of um of your spy characters uh, and how they would how they would explore in heart but also it's very much like no you don't have everything you don't have all your abilities like if you're playing a carrion priest you have to pick the hyena otherwise you don't get it like this like this isn't a game about 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 setting off proudly in, in into the uh in, in, into the undercity to go and do some jobs for them for the ministry this is a game about you know about about them them trying to kill you and failing mm-hmm. So did you hit all the the stretch goals for the for the uh, Kickstarter? Uh, do you know? We we missed the we missed the what? So is the spire? Uh, spire. Sorry for the pivot. Uh, we missed we missed the final stretch goal, which was the uh, uh, handbook to the Vermissian. 
um, which uh, which Mary's writing actually at the moment about they're, 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 they're getting on with that but um, we haven't really worked out how to publish it effectively I'm, I'm sure following up on those Kickstarter stretch goals is tricky as far as all the Kickstarter postmortems I've seen that seems to tend to be a point of contention pretty universally between teams uh, especially uh, you know when you, when you promise an incredible uh, amount of, of material um, so you know, did you guys find a lot of difficulties that with heart approaching it after the Spire Kickstarter, or I uh, feel like you learned? Um, I mean, I feel like you've delivered everything, right? Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think we did actually, and then and, and then, so, yeah. and then we were like, actually, you know what? We're not going to have a stretch goal because we can't come up with anything more. And like a lot of the stretch goals we had, we were just freestyling from the name alone, like legit. So we we came up with all of the names for the um, heart supplements in a pool in yeah. Portugal. Yeah. We, uh, we wrote them down, and then we very much worked out what they were later. Definitely, for Miss, like for Missy and Black Ops, that was that was what we had, and we sold that. And there's an element of like, what the fuck, what the fuck are we gonna do with Missy and Black Ops? I think there was there was a while where like I'd, I'd written, I had I had in my book different versions of the Missy, which you sort of jacked through to get there, and eventually we were like, no, so we can use it as sort of another spy crossover game. Um, but yeah, um, we we learned about. Uh, the the biggest challenge with um, post Kickstarter support in terms of like not only fulfilling your goals but in terms of um, keeping the line going is you need to have a community uh, and we would aspire the shared universe uh, and the shared classes the uh, the fact that everyone has their own opinion on like a- everyone who's like other people who've read and definitely anyone who's played Spire has these touchstones that they can share. From that, you can generate people who are talking about the game and excited. They can start generating their own content. Um, and then you generate the desire for more stuff. So, like, Unbound is self-contained. Um, like, there's no, there's not really any room for expansions in Unbound. Aside from, like, you know, like there's, there's the, we've, we wrote a couple. They're, they're fun. But it was, it was significantly hard work because you can't do any setting in them. And the, uh, like, the... Uh, Spire was successful enough to give us something which we could play with off heart in terms of a community, which meant that if we if we did all these source books, then we could afford to price them into the main Kickstarter because Mary's a business wizard, and then we knew that people would we knew that people would be enthusiastic enough about our previous work and about the world of Destera and about you know the the the, the Drow and the Elfair and the Knolls and stuff to say oh this book looks cool I'll buy that and I'll talk about I'll talk about it to my friends and I think the the community is what's really like Discord and people chatting about it on Twitter and people doing art for it. Um, that's that's really what's allowed us to do that. Yeah, the community around this game and the resistance system in general is, is pretty incredible. Um, and, and we're all pretty thankful, uh, at least I know I am, to, to have the support of the community around Swan Dive and uh, yeah, around the system in general. Uh, so just a just an off, offhanded thought. Uh, are you inspired at all by like... Um, Annihilation and, and sort of the, the weird fiction world at all. I've I've only I've only read Annihilation, um, and so so um, uh, Adrian Tchaikovsky, who's a, he's a sci fi writer, he did um, oh I don't remember what he wrote Dog Soldiers I think and a, a variety of things he's written which are, which, which are very well received. Uh, he, he he's a fan of our work and he he, he was chatting about it on. Um, on Twitter and said like, "Oh, I'm reading. Uh, I'm reading Heart. It's really, really good. Uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, like really like really really evokes similar things to at Jeff Vandermeer." And then because Adrian Tchaikovsky is a renowned is a respected author, Vandermeer turned up and was like, "What do you mean evokes?" <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and, like, and like he was asking if we'd stolen his ideas. <laughs> oh, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, senpai. Oh, I'm really sorry. Uh, but, no, but apparently, apparently, like, uh, yeah, um, uh, Adrian very kindly sort of gave us the, uh, gave us, he put in a good word for us. But it is Calm exci- down, Jeff. Yeah, it is exciting, it's exciting to, to, to think that Senpai could notice me. It's pr- yeah, yeah, I hope he isn't litigious, because it's not a million miles away, is it's, it? It shares themes, but so does all of D&D. You That's true, yeah. Yeah, if, if anyone's got a case, it's, um, well, it's Warhammer, let's be honest, Eric. <laughs> against against the entirety of Spire, Games Workshop aren't litigious, are they in any way? No, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> I'm sure, it's absolutely fine. Let, let me just. Try. Oh no, they're outside. 
Oh my god, there's a thunderhawk in my back garden. There's power armored lawyers coming out of it. <laughs> Godspeed, friend. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 you know, I really like to see your games heart inspire, particularly with a darker tone. They're just a different sort of thing than than a lot of other role playing games. A lot of the lighter stuff that even you know, Grant, you write like Crash Pandas and, and, and Honey Heist, previously discussed. You know, something something like D anD D. You know, on a larger scale, it's just it's something more comfortable. Something more, it's like a sitcom. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fair. It's, it's comfortable and safe, or it's like it's it's, it's like it's like um like what like watching a YouTube channel of like, let's play as you like that sort of thing. Like I like I know what I'm getting into when I sit down to D and D, even if it's with a group of people I've never played before. I've got a rough idea. Whereas Chris is also running Vason, which is a cracking yeah. game about like it's eighteen sixties, it's certain. Yeah, it's nineteenth century. About Sweden. about nineteenth century um, Swedish um, folklorist hunters. It's a cracking game, really lovely, lovely art, really streamlined system. It's the Free League and uh, Mutant Year Zero system, so it all ticks along really nicely, and that's really specific in that. Um, but like, I think there's different games for different things, and like, I like I love playing D and D with some of my more anarchic, ridiculous group because we get the capacity to make shit up and rebel against the rules. And with Vason, we have a much more like measured calm group who are more into investigation and I'm kind of the idiot in the party and that's kind of <laughs> and that's kind of it's nice to experiment with I think I think there's different things for yeah yeah there's different games just there's there's different you know yeah. types of films or you know different uh or or all music yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly I think, I, I think I think music's a really good analogy uh, Rod Edwards in Sorcerer was chatting about this uh, how like you're not you're not always going to make the best music with every group of people like a role-playing game is like a jam session yeah and so so you're working together to make something and that like there's there's no there's no particular like audience in mind for it unless you're recording or streaming it and so not every instrument not every musical style not every person who's who's playing those instruments it's not all going to come together in the same way and that's and that's that, that's okay i think there's uh, part of the issue we have with nerd culture is that no, I'm going to play every game with the same group of people. But it's like we don't have to do everything with everyone. It's okay. Yeah, it's worth it to mix it up and, and find new chemistries with people. Um, speaking of nerd culture, I'm, I'm curious about you guys' thoughts on on where the TRPG world sort of is right now. Um, I think mm. it's you know it's swelling, it's and it's growing into a lot of really exciting places. But um, you know, I feel like there are definitely uh, some some issues. Maybe do you guys have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, one of the big things for me is that tabletop world at the moment really needs some proper criticism mm. like it needs uh like 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 film reviewers of the mid 90s you're roger ebert like so you're rogers ebert yeah it needs it needs critical people to to break things down mm. and to look at things in in an abstract way because like i can i can tell somebody what i think of a game but nobody's gonna listen to me because i've got a stake in this like I'm mm. a games designer. If I say this other person's game is bad because of these reasons, then it looks like I'm attacking them. And I'm I'm absolutely not. I'm just like this is the weak point, right? I I found I had a I had a Twitter thread a while ago on um, uh, Iron Skies the RPG, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is fucking like it's fucking bananas that game. It's like it's like it's like Aladdin's cave of batshit. I'm absolutely intoxicated with the game. Like I, I will be buying a PDF when it comes out, fully because because it's like, it's so different from what I'm into. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like going to Japan or something after growing up in London. It's fascinating, and, and I also think it's terrible, but I'm fascinated by it, and I'm really glad that it exists. And so I did this big thread on it, being like, "Hey, uh, I found this. I found this this playtest, this this uh, this this example of play. Let's talk about it because this is fucking wild." Um, and there are quite a few people who are like, "You shouldn't, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't, you shouldn't um, criticize other people's design decisions. You can criticize their morality, but you can't criticize their design decisions." And I think that 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 really puts you into a place where it's quite hard to learn. I, I I I don't want to put people off making games, you know, and I don't want to I I don't want to encourage gatekeeping or saying oh this isn't a game or like or you know like trying to keep people out of the space isn't going to help. We don't we we don't get anything by keeping people out of our space unless they have really like reprehensible views. But I also think that I think that there's there's uh, just 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 in terms of talking shop, like Chris and I get really excited talking about mechanics we like. And, and and mechanics which we don't like and things like well why why does this work why is this interesting why is this bit flawed and you're not you're not really allowed to talk about it 
And like, if you look at the education system of every country in the world, what that is, is critical understanding. Hmm. That's looking at, like in English, you look at Shakespeare and go, well, what does this mean? What's going on here? What is, what, what is this? What's, what's this? Hmm. But I'm not allowed to do that to a role-playing game? Like, why not? Yeah, like there was that really, really, in my opinion, sort of absurd reaction to that that thread that uh, was critiquing PBTA in a pretty genuine, even-handed way. Oh yeah, it was uh, Riley. I think, I think wasn't so. It? Yeah, it's Riley, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it was, it was pretty. It was pretty like balanced, calm stuff. I think it was like, hey, listen, every, not every game has to be powered by the apocalypse. Okay. Ha- how fucking dare you? I ge- I guess I should just throw my game into an ass then, should I? It's like I, I fucking hate metal music. I think it's garbage. I don't get it. The, I'm a, but I'm allowed to say that. I like the Doom soundtrack. Sure, okay. that's fine. But generally speaking, I, I think it's garbage. Okay. And uh, if I see a metal album, I'm not going to put it on. Mm. There are games that fall into that category for me, mm. and that's fine. Like there's there's games that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna buy. I'm not gonna pick up because they fall into a certain category. Like I'm not the sort of person that can play belonging outside belonging games. You're like a GM. I like a GM, right? Like, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying that's bad for me. Mm. That's my metal music. Yeah. I th- and, like, and like, like the, I think the challenge comes down to, like, because because we're making things, like, because so much of the um, space in tabletop gaming is people who are amateur creators. And I would argue that anyone who sits down and plays a game is an amateur creator. Unless you're just running something precisely from the Pathfinder Adventure module. You're making stuff up, you're acting, you're you're making decisions on the fly, and you feel this ownership over the um over the medium, which very few other people do. I'd so I'd say maybe like football fans. And Star Wars fans. Star Wars fans, so of course, yes, special breed. And I think it's really hard to separate out the idea that well well, well why don't you go do it better? And also like like the it is, it, is, it is a personal thing, and it is very tiring to say, okay, this is my personal opinion, but... Because that is true of anything you say at any time. Um, and, like, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to tweet... I, w- I wouldn't want to put it on my Iron Skies thread from our official Rowan Rook and Deckard account. But, but like, but, but, it's, but it's associated with, with my brand, and my brand is this sort of, like, sort of happy-go-lucky, oh, oh, I've done a game about bears, do you like it? This one's about overthrowing the government. And, and that's fine. It sells, you know. Oh, here, here's a selfie. Oh, I had too much marijuana. Oh. And like, it's it's fine. Whatever. It all, you know, it it, it 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 moves books, and I I can sustain it. But um, it's just it's quite. Yeah, I think I think you're tapping into some frustrations. <laughs> and, and like and like a lot of other people turned up and were like, yeah, fuck this guy. I'm like I'm like I, I think I think like well that's the problem because I've got um you know ten thousand followers on Twitter. And so, if I say I don't like this thing, that's viewed as a as an invitation for the people who like me to go, yeah, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want you to dogpile on this guy. And that's and and that's he's a, that's the, he's, he's a guy making. I, I have nothing against the guy. Well, I I <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I don't have anything against the guy. I don't really know who he is, especially. I think the game design choices he made were baffling and fascinating. And I want to talk about I want to talk about how nuts this is and how and how ant- antithetical it is to to how I view game design and what's good game design. But that but I but I mean it's, it is work. It's gonna it's gonna come as an attack. And it's a shame. But you know what? I will I will I will take the I will take the I'll take the 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 ease that ten thousand followers lets me uh, market things and share my opinions and gain new insights on my work. Um, with the challenge of having to maybe be a bit muted in some things. Yeah. Whereas Chris is a ghost. Yeah, so much easier. <laughs> Can't even find him on Twitter. <laughs> really hard. Thank you, thank you very much for having us on your podcast. Chris. Weirdly lovely. Chris, let's go home. Oh. <laughs> to sleep. <laughs> to sleep. Perhaps the chance to design. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for listening to this podcast about Spire. And thank you, I presume, for buying our products. We love you very much. <laughs> Bye.
thank you so much for listening to this episode and thank you so 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 much to grant and chris for joining me i really hope all of you that are joining us for the first time hopefully drawn by chris and grant's uh, illustrious careers uh, will take the time to listen to the rest of swan dive and join us on the rest of this journey make sure to follow us at savage godlings on twitter and to find us wherever you find your podcasts safe travels my friends <laughs>